Hello everybody, thanks for joining our webinar today. Uh, this is a webinar hosted by Advanced MD with a vendor partner HIPAA One. Today we'll be talking about the five simple ways that we see are very easy to do within your practice to reduce healthcare, healthcare breaches. So in this webinar we'll discuss today why healthcare providers have more trouble with privacy and what you can do to, to protect that as a healthcare provider. Easy to implement techniques and best practices that you can use to protect your practice. And then cybersecurity and malware, just the basics, what to understand, what, you know, how to get started with this in your own practice. And then how you can complete a HIPAA security risk analysis while using our vendor partners HIPAA One. Uh, I think this is uh, a general term, the risk analysis, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. So we'll show you how to break that down to easy steps. And then we'll today as well have an open session, a Q&A session with our HIPAA auditors. So in, in, with the introductions today, uh, let me just share with you, we'll have a very open forum. Feel free to type in the questions as you, as you see them. We'll try and answer them as we go. But we'll generally get to the meat of the, of the questions in, in our Q&A session. Today we have uh, HIPAA 1, as I've discussed. We have Stephen Marco. We have Bobby Sieg Siegmiller in the office with us today. So I'll turn the time to them and let them take it from here. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Good to be here on this uh, holiday weekend. So we are going to provide a, uh, a lot of fun for you, hopefully before you go into the holidays. So all you need to think about uh, while you're relaxing is HIPAA compliance and breaches. How's that? Um, that was a joke. So uh, before we get started, we do this uh, on each of the calls. We want to understand who we have in the audience, who's attending. Are you uh, administrative, EHR, IT staff, clinical, or legal? If you wouldn't mind, just answer the question uh, real quick. And that way, Steve and I have a better idea of who we want to address certain topics to or as questions come in uh, to best suit your needs and provide you with the, the information you need. Um, you know, to resolve any, any uh, problems or issues that you might have. So just give a couple more seconds mm -hmm. uh, for this poll. So which option best describes your role, administrative, EHRIT, clinical staff, or legal? We'll close the poll in about uh, two seconds. One, and I think we're good. All right, show the results there. So 63% administrative, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, we typically see, and then we've got the other uh, part, Clinical and legal counsel. So sad. We usually have one or two legal folks on the call. Well, so. This is very helpful. Usually it's a higher percentage of clinical staff today. So we'll definitely link this back more to how things work in the front office. Awesome. This is good. And, and mm -hmm. no legal. So I can say whatever I want with zero accountability. I love it. All right. So today's agenda, um, we are going to discuss some of the healthcare uh, provider, you know, privacy troubles, things that, that you find challenges with. And again, as we're speaking to something, you say, oh yeah, that's us. Um, and you have additional questions, please throw them out there. Uh, we'll go through very quickly five ways to reduce uh, these data breaches. How do they occur? We'll give you a little context and background on that. And then again, what you can do to avoid those. There's some very, very simple things um, that, that we'll outline that you can take home today. And then uh, cybersecurity and malware, and like I said, Q and A's we go through. Absolutely, it. please, at any time, uh, don't be shy. Uh, send any questions, anything HIPAA related. Uh, we work with clinics like yourselves, uh, hospitals, uh, large health uh, healthcare payers, a lot of business associates, and we apply the HIPAA security and privacy rule um, accordingly. So anything HIPAA related, please feel free to chime in anytime in the question box. Thank you. Little uh, about us. I think uh, most of the advanced MB clients have been using HIPAA One or very familiar, have attended one of the webinars, but we've always got to just disclose again. We've been doing this for a long time. We've got about 7,000 client sites, as Steve mentioned, that range from large health plans to single physician practices. And we, we do everything uh, develop and maintain here in the U.S. and want to make sure that we're always up to date with the latest audit protocol. But our big disclaimer is, you know, we're not attorneys, but we've got to understand this information uh, so that we can educate you on what the HIPAA regulatory requirements are. We want to start off today with uh, a couple of items that maybe uh, will be a little bit more interesting than HIPAA. We try and bring a little bit of light and sometimes humor into the sometimes dark and dreary world of HIPAA compliance. A survival story, and we'll tie this into 
HIPAA in just a moment, not to be confused with the hippo that's on the screen. So back in 2012, I purchased these photographs from a British photojournalist that was in uh, Africa. Uh, they were at a federal park and uh, noticed that there was a gameskeeper here, uh, as pictured, and uh, was able to survive a charge from a hippopotamus. Now, anyone that's been to Africa knows that the hippopotamus is the number one killer of human beings by wildlife every year in Africa. They weigh about 5,500 pounds, but the weight of a uh, large uh, uh, pickup truck. They can run up to 21 miles an hour, only over short distances, and the males will charge to protect their territory, females will charge to protect their young. Understanding all of those elements, this gameskeeper, by the time uh, the hippo was charging out of the ditch from eating grass, it was a male, uh, he was already uh, running to get a head start, knowing that they can't run long distances and was able to survive another day. Uh, now, you know, as a gameskeeper, this is pretty obvious skills that you need to have and be, be aware of your environment. With respect to HIPAA and healthcare, there's some key elements that we need to be aware of to avoid being attacked by the hippo. By the way, if anyone on the call here says to the uh, Office for Civil Rights that we're comparing them as the enforcers of HIPAA to this hippopotamus, we're going to deny it. This is Pat, our mascot. Uh, for those that have been on the call before, a brief reintroduction for those that are new. Uh, HIPAA, again, brings a, our, our, our mascot, Pat, this harkens from the uh, Saturday Night Live days. We're not sure if Pat's a boy or a girl, as you can tell by the lab coat and the strategically placed stethoscope, but Pat brings a little bit of light into the sometimes dark and dreary world of HIPAA, and Pat stands for Physical, Administrative, and Technical Safeguards, uh, which, uh, which is the foundation of any HIPAA security risk analysis. Up here on the screen, uh, we wanted to have a a baseline. What exactly is a breach? Um, now, a breach, the definition of a breach was revised back in 2013 uh, with the new HIPAA, HIPAA omnibus rule, omnibus for all encompassing. Um, a data breach as of 2013 is now presumed to have occurred when there has been an unauthorized exposure of EPHI unless the healthcare organization or health insurance provider employer or vendor slash business associate can demonstrate that there's a low probability that patient data was compromised. This up on the screen is something that we use for our coaching for clinics to really get a clear definition. There's three steps on breach notification. Step one is, has a breach actually happened? So in the green area, uh, when we're made aware of the breach is really what that key process is. And we need to determine if it was um, secured or unsecured. One of the best ways to avoid a breach, still the number one um, reason for uh, the highest occurrence of having to report a breach to Health and Human Services is still theft, loss, and improper disposal. If the, that data is encrypted, there is a very low likelihood and it's that, it, that PHI data was actually compromised, so therefore it's secured. If it's secured, then we can attest that no breach has actually occurred that requires notification for those individuals. That's why encryption is such a big deal, and we'll go into more details on that shortly. If it's unsecured, then the omnibus rule also introduced three different ex exceptions for those incidents where you may have faxed maybe a patient record to the wrong clinic, a good faith unintentional acquisition or access of PHI by the employee or the workforce, that's internal. Uh, B is inadvertent disclosure to another uh, person or entity, um, or an authorized person within the entity. And then C, if the recipient could have not have reasonably retained the data. So any of these three boxes would qualify as an exception under Omnibus. If you are unsecured and we don't qualify for one of these exceptions, you need to call us at the end of this call and we can certainly help you define that process and continue from there. So given the fact that our discussion today is on breach-related incidents, we wanted to throw up a new question there. Have you ever been audited uh, as an organization, whether it be Figlio's, the OCR, any type of audit, um, have you ever had to experience uh, you know, what it's like to go through that. So just quick uh, yes or no question. We'll just give it a second for you to answer that. Three, two, one, and uh, close the poll there. Excellent. So, no. so th this is interesting. You know, we were talking about this yesterday. Based on the response, we take this conversation a couple different ways. 
we have seen this evolution in the past of uh, exactly what's on the screen. It used to be a random audit program. You know, a few hundred would be selected, randomly audited. Figliozzi was another program. This accounting firm won uh, the bid to, you know, do these random audits, report their findings, and that's where a lot of the education training and, and you know, some fines resulted from. It's a different game now. Um, by the response, 100% of you have flown under the radar. Um, you know, as we do these polls and have more uh, attendees on the call, we start to see that number of people that have been audited increase. Why is that? What, what is the reason for that? Well, there's a new portal that, that you will be reporting through. And I believe that, you know, this year and next, you're going to see the audit in the form of an email invitation. Please submit the following uh, artifacts, your HIPAA security risk assessment, your uh, proof of training and policies and procedures, where, where these things had not been asked in the past, but we're seeing more and more of our clients being asked to submit uh, this documentation. You know, do you have, uh, have you done a vulnerability scan? I mean, a lot of, a lot of different things mm -hmm. today than just even a year ago. So mm -hmm. Um, if, if you think that life is good, you're, you may be participating in Meaningful Use, the MIPS, MACRA program, this is a requirement. Even if you're not participating in that, there's an overarching uh, regulatory requirement called HIPAA that requires you to do this risk assessment every year, and flying under the radar uh, is going to be a thing of the past. Everybody's going to be required to submit this documentation. And again, if you don't, uh, I'm not trying to scare you, but the fines are about $50,000 per infraction, uh, you know, as you find uh, some issues with the organization. So um, we want to go through, and I'll have Steve explain some of these. These are the, these are the top five areas that we see uh, people getting in trouble. Therefore, we want to provide you answers and solutions on how to reduce or avoid these healthcare breaches and then kind of tie it into the regulatory requirement. Yep. Absolutely. We're going to have some fun today. You know, uh, we've been um, we've been in this line of business doing HIPAA compliance now since 2012. And we've had uh, we've got many clients that have been uh, that have been with us since 2012. And we have found that surprisingly enough, there's some additional benefits outside of, you know, uh, being 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 prepared for that imminent HIPAA attack. If you're if you're at that national park. Um, one of them is surprisingly uh, improved employee morale within the clinic on the front office, particularly. And the reason for that is because with policies and procedures, training and awareness and periodic reminders, the staff and we're all we're all productive individuals in healthcare. We want to contribute, know what their expectations are by management. So we'll go into some more details here on how you can propagate that code of conduct from the top of your clinic all the way through to the different aspects of staff throughout the throughout the levels of the clinic. You know, it's interesting. Greg has a fascinating uh, com comment here, and he's dead on. He said, you know, this is a disturbing result. It breeds complacency and perceived notion that, um, the, you know, these services are not needed. And, and he's dead on. We've seen an evolution since Steve started this in 2012. It, it used to be education, education. Hey, there's this requirement as part of this meaningful use thing buried in Core Measure 15, this thing called a security risk assessment that you had to do. And we spent several years educating the audience that you have to do this. We saw the hospitals and clinics come aboard. Um, you know, we're just seeing dental, behavioral health, optometry, you know, these, these uh, ancillary um, you, you know, not really in the hospital, but ancillary uh, services starting to come to the party. This has been a requirement for, for many, many years, not just because of the Meaningful Use Program, but you have to have policies and procedures in place, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You have to have mm -hmm. a, a uh, you know, a security risk assessment. I wish we had the question up here, have you done a risk assessment? Because I, <laughs> I think we'd see 80 to 90 percent of the people say no. Uh, to that question. But yeah. again, complacency, do not get caught flat-footed because when they come, when that email is there, you have about two weeks, which is 10 days, uh, business days, to respond to that audit. If you don't have any everything in place, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and the fines are quite large and we see it uh, yeah. every day. Again, if, that, if you do get audited, contact us directly. <laughs> Typically, we'll help you uh, they're very uh, generous in responding quickly to uh, extensions for that response of three weeks, so that helps a lot. If you have your HIPAA risk analysis in HIPAA 1, you log in, click a button, and there's the report. You send it off and go on with your day. Certainly, if you're using spreadsheets or the OCR's audit tool, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit more complicated than that. And 
uh, typically the audit doesn't just ask you for the risk analysis, they actually ask you for the actual policy and procedure, the measure, the control, and examples of that being enforced. So um, the number one way to reduce healthcare breaches is to do this mandatory HIPAA security risk analysis, which is basically there's 72 requirements that are picked by the Office for Civil Rights. They're the um, enforcement arm for HIPAA, HIPAA compliance. 72 items, and we ask questions on those. And if you say yes, we ask you to prove it with a certain standard because that's what will happen during an audit. If you don't have it or, or you know, maybe, because everyone always says, yes, we've got that policy and procedure, but very rarely can we provide it and very rarely has it been reviewed or updated in the past three years. And even more rarely is it included in the training and awareness for the organization. But we'll, we'll get more on that later. So the HIPAA security risk analysis will then give you a risk analysis on all those gaps in compliance and sort them by risk and help provide you with a plan on what to do to help uh, put that measure in place to be compliant with HIPAA, thereby reducing the risk to something that's more reasonable. I'm gonna bring up another Poll question here, Bobby, did you want to make a comment? Nope, I was just going to ask the question. You would like to ask the question if we've had a breach, or do you want to ask a question, why is Pat wearing blue on the <laughs> previous screen? Just want to let you know we've got Pat in address as well. Uh, we uh, love our LGBT uh, community. We love everyone. So uh, Pat is definitely um, there wearing all sorts of different clothes. Anyways. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So so have you had a breach? Uh, again, a change of subject to uh, you know truth time. We are not health and human services here. Have you had a breach? Yes, no, or what's a breach? And you can be honest, nobody's going to see these results. Um, but, but this is key. I'm curious to see uh, what the response is on whether you've had a breach or not. So let's just give you another couple seconds to answer this. So just a friendly reminder, so no one answers C if they already have. A breach is presumed to have occurred when there has been an unauthorized exposure of EPHI. All right, let's uh, let's close this poll and see how we stack up. Let's share the results here. Okay, so 11%, so 89% no, uh, 10% uh, essentially have had a breach-related incident. I want to share something that um, we have found in, in our experience doing this. They say that most breaches are not even detected. You have no idea uh, anybody has even been in your system and taken data to be able to report a breach or even be aware of a breach. So I'm assuming the 10% uh, know whether it was, uh, you know, a, a patient complaint, whistleblower, um, you know, theft or loss or a hacking incident. Most hacking incidents uh, about 12 to 18 months later, yep. if you have some forensic data to prove that, you know, you'll be able to, to see if, if uh, you know, that was the cause and, and what was grabbed. But again, most, if you do not have a, a strong uh, network architecture and software in place to detect that, you have no idea that you've even been breached. So let's pull up that uh, next question yeah, of, those, answer. of those 10%. What, what caused yeah. the breach? Was yeah. it theft? Was it an unauthorized disclosure? Was it malware hacking or, or something else? So unauthorized disclosure, just a, that's a very broad term. Uh, that could be uh, someone within the office accessing a record out of curiosity. This is it, the brother-in-law, the ex-boyfriend, sure. the uh, ex-spouse. Exactly. It could be it, it could be faxing a, a patient chart to the wrong office or emailing it to the wrong person. Um, we didn't ask the question if the breach, in, you know, how many records, but uh, that's B is kind of that umbrella definition. Theft is someone breaks into your car and takes your laptop, or uh, you know, I would include missing uh, missing. Um, electronic media, thumb drives, phones as theft, and then malware hacking C, uh, that's when, well, we'll go into a couple of examples here in just a moment, but uh, if you haven't had the joy of experiencing uh, C, um, they say that mathematically, if you take no measures, your probability of being uh, hacked or breached is 100%. So all those elements being, let's uh, go ahead and close the polls and let's have a look at these results. Yes. So unauthorized disclosure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Another. Okay. Well, All right. That's well, that, good. That, that will tee us mm -hmm. into uh, our next topic, which uh, goes over passwords and what we can do to secure those passwords. What do they need to look like? What's the requirement? Do I have to change it? Mm -hmm. so. Well, you know, why are passwords important? Well, there's it's, it's actually twofold. 
Uh, one is for accountability. Each person should have a unique user account into your EHR, into Advanced MD. So that way you're not sharing, you know, nurse one or doctor one and five people are using it because if that patient asks, can you please give me a record, which they have the right to and, and legally have to respond federally, federally within 30 days, give them a list of all the people that have accessed uh, their chart and where that chart has gone since it's been in your possession. So it's going to be impossible to understand who sent the record where when the person that did it on the uh, accounting of disclosures record log says nurse one. So uh, that could get you into a lot of hot water. So we're all about proactively avoiding getting hit by by the hippo. Well, in the Cedar Sinai's case, this is an interesting one. We didn't have it on the uh, uh, slide deck today, but with Kim Kardashian and the unauthorized access by the MA. Um, this was back when she was in for her first um, baby, and yeah. um, uh, Kanye was there in the hospital, and people were accessing that chart to find out if it was a boy or a girl. Yeah, and we don't. Uh, Again, could have been a, a myriad of reasons why they were accessing how much does the baby weigh, whose is it? You know, we, we, we don't know any of that. But the point is, is these doctors were brought in and they said, why were you accessing? You, you're not part of this experience. And they were like, I never, I, I wasn't doing that. I was in surgery. Yeah. And no, you were. Here's, you know, the time date stamp IP. You know, we track. It's your user ID. And it was actually one of the medical assistants that had the passwords that were looking up um, yeah, you know, you, confidential information, and that is a breach. If using wanted, the doctor's credentials. Yeah, to, to log so in. Because, because that way no one's going to question the doctor and they won't be ever found out. They were actually terminated from their positions. That, uh, that was a very high-profile case. Um, the underpants analogy, uh, I really like that because, yeah, <laughs> you know, we're always trying to we're always trying to draw a little bit of humor into into the area into the area of, of HIPAA compliance, but also there's two things to know about passwords. Okay, so from a patient, you know, um, health record perspective, uh, you want to change them often so someone obviously doesn't use your password to access those charts and you get in trouble. We just covered that, so you want to change them often. But notice that there's different underpants for different occasions. We've got boxer shorts and we've got briefs. So if you're going for a hike or you're doing something very athletic, you're probably going to opt for the briefs. If you're going to do something more relaxing and casual, you maybe want to go for the boxer shorts. The reason why I'm bringing this up, our recommendation to those in healthcare that use technology, which is 99.9% .9 of us, is to have, we're all going to, you know, use our dog or our daughter or our spouse or something to remind us. And, and that's what hackers use uh, to help crack your password. Use different passwords, maybe different iterations of the same password for different levels of confidence you have in the application that you're using. Okay, so if you're using, if you're going online and you're registering, you know, uh, to, you know, it's for, for that, uh, you know, for that news group on, on, on uh, new puppies, because you have a new puppy dog, you know, don't use the same password that you use for your online banking, that you use for your EMR software. Use a lesser password for that level of trust. Use higher level passwords and fewer times for those areas that you really need it. Uh, and try and use those different levels of passwords for the different levels. Well, and, and key, I mean, just reading says change them often, keep them private, never share them with anybody. You know, as we do on-site walkthroughs, um, a lot of people use a little password backup, uh, you know, app to track their passwords. I see a lot of backup. Uh, on sticky notes under keyboards or in a drawer. You know, I had a guy laughing who goes, yeah, I don't keep mine under the keyboard, opened his drawer, and it was it was in the top of the drawer stuck there. And I'm like, great place. Nobody would ever find that. <laughs> you know, be careful with those passwords. They That's the first place people look if there was uh, unauthorized access in the way of a break-in. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to flip up the you know bottom of the computer and pretty easy to find. Sometimes if they're not creative, we see them stuck to the monitor, yep. which is the worst place to put it. Absolutely. And, you know, if you're not sharing your password or making it more difficult for others to compromise your user account and hold you accountable for your user account, which we're trying to make sure that we avoid that, uh, you want to lock your computer when you walk away. Absolutely. Uh, th there's a little trick that uh, we constantly communicate out on webinars and, and all of our publications. There's a little Windows key. Um, it's the, I believe it's the command key for using a Mac uh, and Windows. 
uh, it's a little Windows key plus L. So if you hold the Windows key and push L, I won't do it now, otherwise it'll lock our computer, but it will lock your computer and you can walk away with just two fingers there. Uh, lock and you can walk away, not worry about someone else walking up behind you and saying, I'm just going to access this chart here. Next thing you know, three months later, you're being called into an interview by the audit team to find out why you were accessing you know, patient ABC when you really had nothing to do with it. You know, and I, I've seen this twice personally. I, I was uh, in a facility with my uh, spouse and sitting there, and there was the screen wide open. I saw my wife's name and about 15 others, and I took a picture. Um, and uh, she said, don't you dare do anything. This is my favorite doctor. <laughs> but, but, but I can say I could have, uh, with a couple uh, touches of the mouse, seen any of those patient records. I've also seen it on a uh, cow, the cart on wheels, and the politically correct term, I know that's wow. changed. It's Workstation wow on wheels. Okay, so it's not yeah. a cow. And we're not trying to fend cows or hippos or anybody there. But um, again, in a long-term care facility, as I was walking down the hall, there was the patient record, nobody around. And, and I'm like, oh, this is so, this is not good. That does constitute uh, a, a breach of information because it's accessible. I could see where the patient was, where their room number was, mm -hmm. and within a few clicks could have seen a lot more information that I was not authorized to see. So it is important that you guys, as you walk away from these uh, wows and from your workstations, you've got to log off. Yeah, or at, at least lock your computer so when you come back, uh, you know, and we're going to actually show you a little trick. If you have that person in your clinic or that person in your administrative office that never locks their computer and you just don't want to keep nagging them about it, we're going to show you a little trick here that will definitely help raise awareness uh, and actually could have some fun with it as well. Uh, we are down to our, this is either our last or second last poll question. We're going to bring it up here on the screen if we would please. Uh, have you ever had an a patient, since we have a lot of uh, clinical staff more so than the normal, uh, a patient complaint to Health and Human Services. This usually results in a letter from the Office for Civil Rights just saying, hey, this person said the following, and there's alleged HIPAA violations. Can you please reply with your policies and procedures around these areas? And, um, you know, being in healthcare, uh, most people that come to see us are not feeling well and they're usually uh, in a bad place mentally and they're more prone to find ways to vent a little bit of that even though you try and do your best to make them feel better. Let's wrap up the poll here in three, two, one, and have a look at those results. Okay, all right, so we've had a few complaints and most haven't. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, um, we're going to ease off on all the poll questions here, but this tells us that, uh, that well, 17%, you know, that's actually the number one reason to be put on the radar screen uh, for Office for Civil Rights is when uh, a patient goes and logs in. You can go to Health and HHS website. If you Google uh, um, patient complain HHS, you'll be brought, I believe it's the number one link there uh, on being able to fill in a form and they put in the name and the circumstances of the, uh, of the complaint and the Office for Civil Rights is legally required to follow up on that. Uh, and they will audit you a very small subset of the HIPAA citations that are relevant to the complaint. And um, in many cases, uh, they are dismissed as an incidental disclosure if you have your policies, procedures in place. And it sounds like most of you, you haven't been fined, you haven't fully audited, so you've probably been able to provide notice of privacy practices and bench all of your evidence of procedures to avoid getting the ultimate audit. So we, we commend you on that. And those for of you that have not had a, a patient complain, you're doing an exemplary job of helping your patients feel better. Absolutely. Um, let's jump. So we've covered uh, the HIPAA security risk analysis kind of at a high level what that is. You know, where are our gaps? What's our risk based on those gaps? How do we fix those gaps? And then how do we prove the documentation that we've done the risk analysis to have a strong password, lock your computers, uh, change them often and don't share them with anyone. Obviously, you don't want to share rashes with anyone. I'm just kidding. You want to be uh, held accountable for what you do and not what other people do with your account. Number three is training and awareness. And this is an area that we've seen a very wide adoption in the industry over the past year. Uh, training and awareness programs. Uh, they are out there. There's many. We have our own uh, training and awareness programs that are in line with the same policy and procedure templates that we provide, which is all circled around the Office for Civil Rights Audit Protocol, which is what we're 
preparing for that ultimate hippo attack, if you will. Um, and we want to cover a few um, areas there. Uh, the policy and, and procedure, for those of us that are on the call saying, what, it, what really is a policy and procedure? We use that term all the time. It's, it's, it's a piece of paper that sits in a binder on my desk. No. Let's take one step back. A policy and procedure is, is a derivative of the code of conduct of your clinic, your organization. How, what are your hours of operation? How are patients to be treated? How are we going to be dressed? What, what time is break time? What's our HR policy for PTO? All of those things stem to set the expectations of your staff and how your outward facing code of conduct happens. So a policy is a statement by the owners of the organization or the executive branch on the intent to do something. So a policy statement will be a high level statement on, you know, for this reason, we're going to be complying with HIPAA or for this reason, we want, you know, we're in healthcare, we're, 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 we're an, an OBG, um, OBGYN office, we want to ensure the comfort of all of our patients, therefore we will assure them that their information is safe and that we'll display our notice of privacy practices so they're aware of what they're going to do. The procedure is the, what, the, what are the steps that are going to happen that, that we need to see, the measurable steps, uh, to be in line with that policy statement by the executive team. So in this case, uh, the content of notice uh, is going to contain the following elements, and that's going to be provided to all the patients upon uh, intake. Uh, you know, and, 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 and you create these policies and procedures. We actually have a policy and procedure. We've consolidated them. We're on version five this year. We're constantly updating them to be in line and distilled. Uh, this is actually an example of what that looks like. And the areas in yellow are things that by minimum you have to edit in order to be, um, in order to uh, have the arrangement. And by the way, the training that we're showing here, one of the questions on the HIPAA security risk analysis, do you have evidence that, you know, are you doing, do you have a, a training process that's in line, you know, with, with the organization's policies and procedures? So I, I want to reiterate this point that Steve's talking about. In the past, we've never seen uh, a, a request for proof of HIPAA compliance training. We are seeing it now. So any administrative staff on the call if you're doing HIPAA compliance training, doesn't matter what it is. There's no regulatory requirement stating how long it needs to be, what the content is. Mm -hmm. um, it can be 30 minutes. It can be an hour. What you need to do is document it. That is the key uh, that we're starting to see the question relating to this. Who took it? And, you know, I don't know if they actually go through what score they took, but who took it? Did they pass? And, and the date. And then there's sometimes a signature uh, field, you know, that the individual signed off on. But, but that is new. So make sure uh, as a takeaway, when you do that training uh, with that wonderfully yep. engaging PowerPoint that you're documenting on a sheet <laughs> and, and putting that in the binder front yep. and center because it is going to be uh, requested in the event of an audit. No, that's a good point. I mean, you're all, we're all in healthcare, whether you're on the clinical side, administrative side. On the IT side, maybe you don't see it so much, but you'll be able to resonate with the fact that if the paperwork isn't filed, it didn't happen. So documentation is, you couldn't be more spot on, Bobby. It's critical. When you're dealing with the federal government or state government, if the paperwork isn't filed, it didn't happen. So this documentation is the paperwork. What we're showing you right now is excerpts. So this, this is showing a list, a very small sample list showing all the people that have completed the training within this particular context. Over here, we've just got a slide. This is one of the Q&A slides. We have gamified training, and of course, it's got pad in it, uh, where we do a short skit with an animated cartoon showing certain scenarios that typically happen, and then ask questions on what you, know, what you feel should be the right answer. And um, this is a, an example of the modules we, ha we have for privacy uh, that cover these elements. Now, these, again, are in line with the policy and procedure templates that are all rooted in the gospel that is the Office for Civil Rights HIPAA audit protocol. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, HIPAA compliance training, when we hear that, we want to scratch our eyes out. I do, um, even. So that is why, and you can't really see the modules unless you get your binoculars out on the bottom right there. But those are the different modules that we have. But on the left bottom, you'll see PAD, and it's, it is gamified. Well, the clinical staff do. They have microscopes. Yes, that's true. So they could see that. 
Um, I can't see it. But on the bottom left, uh, we, we try to make it engaging because we are a society that needs to be entertained. Um, it's not the boring PowerPoint. It's very you know interesting as we go through this compliance training. Anybody that is on the call today, you're welcome to call us. We have training that's included at no charge. Mm -hmm. So we'll give it to you. We're going to start shifting gears into the fun part of, of the uh, webinar. If those of you that are already having fun, stay on the edge of your seat because we're about to have even more fun. So um, we actually found this really simple uh, tool. Uh, we know it as bookmarks. Uh, we we created these kind of friendly reminder bookmarks, and we deliver them whenever we do um, privacy and breach risk analysis, which is a separate product from the security risk analysis because it's a different discipline. As we know, the EPHI on the security side is 33% technical. It's around the electronic safeguards for electronic protected health information, whereas Privacy deals with rights to, you know, release of information when and where you can't release information and breach we covered already. This bookmark is surprisingly effective. Now, I, I've got to qualify what the bookmark is. Yes. We were at a health plan walking around and yep. saw these and Thank Steve you. and I kind of had a little giggle. You know, yeah, let's put our bookmark in our iPad. Yeah, you know, he, he, uh, we found that this was extremely effective. It, the intent is not for a book. We know that, uh, you know, the pioneers read paperback books back in the day. We don't do that anymore because we're in a digital society. But this is fascinating. Everything is on a little bookmark piece of paper. And where do we place those, Steve? Uh, these, these get placed next to your screen, pinned up on your wall next to a picture of your family. Uh, when, when your staff, uh, it could be clinical or administrative, is on the phone, maybe they're waiting for something to happen, their eyes are wandering, and where does it fall? On reminders to retrieve PHI from printers to clear desks of PHI don't you know and passwords lock your drawers they just read this you know we all do we look for things to kind of keep our brains occupied sometimes while we're waiting so to have these on the desks will you know reduce your chances of, of having because people are our biggest asset in healthcare, they're also the number one reason why we have all these problems with breaches and um, unauthorized access. This is 24-7 marketing. As we go to these larger sites, mm -hmm. it was interesting. Those that had these little bookmarks somewhere, like Steve said, pinned up on the wall, sitting next to the computer, their computer screens were always locked as they were walking away. They saw the little window symbol there, you know, control L, you walk away. Um, we did have several that were unlocked. Interesting correlation. Uh, no little bookmarks. So bottom line, these little bookmarks um, are available to anybody that wants them. Just let us know how many you need and you distribute those mm -hmm. around each of the workstations yeah. uh, just, just to help with the compliance program. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens if you have a uh, workstation that you've trained them, huh. they've, they've signed off on the training, that, that they know they should log off when they walk away? What, what happens if they... Uh, leave that open. And this is something that every one of you can do as a fun prank that won't uh, get you in any bit of trouble. So right. Well, check this out. So we had um, a new salesperson start and uh, I got tired of reminding them to lock their workstation. So I went and kind of did an old school change of their wallpaper, hit all their icons. And I just, I created that little um, graphic there using paint while they were in the restroom. Just so you know, that is not a password written on that yellow sticky, by the way. Um, so when they came back, they were like, oh, geez. And, you know, they were, it wasn't so much that they came back and realized that this was not a real, um, not a real ransomware attack, but it was more how everyone socially around them was saying, oh, you got, you got pwned, you got hacked, you know. And I am the president of the company, so I can get away with these things. You know, um, this is something I would do if I was a supervisor or... Uh, you may want to do this and just kind of take one step back and, and know the secret to how to get out of it. But, and, and before you mm -hmm. show them, this is a cool trick. So anybody on the call, write this URL down that we're going to show you here. But in the IT world, it used to be called yeah. hassle hoffing. And it's, it's inappropriate now. Don't recommend doing that. But it used to be you walk away from your workstation, you come back, and there's a beautiful picture of David Hasselhoff. Uh, wearing something or spread not. eagle naked um, with nothing but a puppy on. Yes. Yeah, so so there's a lot, and I wasn't going to go there because it could be offensive. <laughs> but um, we don't do that anymore and don't condone that. But this is a fun way 
just to, it doesn't matter how technical you are, yeah. that, that you can really send a message well, that this is important. So show them how. Well, you just do before that. I do that, you know, for all of us that were kind of uh, feeling a little bit insignificant back in high school, I mean, the person, the scary image of the person with the hood, it's like a 15 year old boy that is late for dinner right now trying to get into their Minecraft game. Um, so anyway, uh, building a compliant culture. So this is a much quicker way to do it without having to edit screens and change wallpapers. So if you're using Chrome, for example, you go to this website. It's called www.cryptoprank.com. And you go ahead and click on it. And I'm going to go ahead and do that right now at the, uh, at the, at the, at the risk of... All right, I... Well, maybe touch your screen there. Here, let me uh, turn off the laser pointer here because that seems to be uh, something that is not... There we go. Will that let us do it? Okay, I'm going to show you with my own laptop so you're not, you know, you're like wondering, hey, what exactly are these guys propagating over here? So how it works. So long story short, you pick your uh, poison. I'm going to pick Peta. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Now, I'm going to go ahead. I, I don't know how well this is coming through, but if anyone has uh, seizures, please take your anti-seizure medication uh, immediately. You push F11. Look at that. Now it's full screen. Okay, F11. That's the key, is F11 with Chrome. Uh, the person comes back from the restroom. They didn't lock their computer. Everyone's walking by their screen. They can see the patient in information. They come back and see this. They touch it, and now they're starting to set in saying, oh, crap, I think I've seen something like this on YouTube. This looks like I'm in trouble. They may or may not call the IT person. Now, at this particular point, you want two things to happen. One is just give it enough time for that experience to set in, like, I really should have locked my computer. Two, um, just before they call IT, perhaps, because, you know, IT won't be too happy about this, you can push F11, okay, and that, and that goes back to the browser window, and you can either minimize it or you can X out of the box, okay? So what that will do is you can leave that flashing. It's going to draw a lot of attention. It's going to raise awareness in the organization socially. Very quickly, where it'll get around that if you leave your computer unlocked that you might get crypto pranked. So uh, there's a little measure. Hopefully that's something that can be fun. Hopefully the, um, the culture in your organization is such that you can do this. And, and you know, uh, um, I don't think that this would be something that would be a um, breach of any human resources policies and procedures as opposed to the person leaving their computer unlocked in the first place. And, and great post April Fool's joke for friends and family too. Oh, no it doubt. never gets old. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we've covered uh, training and awareness, um, along with having a strong and changeable password, lock your computer, and automated HIPAA security risk analysis, which is the least administrative way to find out how compliant you are with those HIPAA requirements. I wanted to make one quick mention. The HIPAA security risk analysis is required annually. Okay, so you may be audited up to six years in arrears for your HIPAA security risk analysis. You are expected to comply with all privacy and breach. There's no requirement for a risk analysis. You're just expected to be compliant and have policies and procedures for every one of those measures. Working together. Uh, we are always big fans of working together. Um, IT, uh, you know, it's, it's really rewarding lately. It seems that, you know, back in 2013, 2014, uh, with the omnibus rule coming out, everyone was deputizing their IT person as the HIPAA security officer or the CIO. And whenever we see a CIO as a HIPAA security officer, we realize that that may not be the best fit because they're not ready to drop everything every time someone has a lost computer or perhaps a virus attack. Um, the, uh, these days, um, IT is being more of a, of a facilitator for a compliance role, meaning a different person is making requests. Can you please give me the uh, accounting of disclosures uh, for this particular patient chart, or maybe I need access to the logs of the database to make sure that people aren't connecting to our um, our EMR uh, in an unauthorized fashion. Um, we want to. We need in, in, in encryption. Uh, we need wireless encryption. We need a web filter because it's not just enough to lock your computer. It's not just enough to be aware of not to open up emails from people you don't know. If you're targeted by a hacking group or by a competitor, if you're targeted by any hacker, they will, they will, they will follow you and shadow you uh, on your social networks, on Instagram, uh, on, on, on Facebook, uh, any social media. They will follow different staff members on the executive team 
find out what interest they have, see if they log into portals for their interest, and then from there, you see you most of those like, you know, bowling leagues or hiking leagues or, you know, church websites, uh, when we're using user IDs and passwords, typically they're not, they're not patched, meaning there's ways to get passwords and users out of there. And then if they can match that to your account at work or your, or your banking account, odds are you're using the same password. So, um, you, you know, the IT needs to be facilitating, but they need to know what your requirements are. So we're going to jump into that. By the way, if this is the conversation with your IT department or with your IT folks, we have a lot of IT folks on the call today. I'm sure this is not the case for any of them, but uh, you may want to start looking at maybe working with a different individual from that department. Breaches are actually not less expensive the second time. The OCR will definitely fine you another 1.5 million if you haven't taken any measures or if you're confused about the requirements because really it shouldn't be that way. So we talked about the difference between security, which is physical, administrative, and technical safeguards. So policies and procedures, as well as encryption data at rest, all these different elements. Privacy is patient rights, appropriate disclosures, when to release information, breach notification. The Office for Civil Rights will enforce any of these laws. You're expected to comply with all of them. On the security side, you're expected to provide a security risk analysis plus policies and procedures and evidence of uh, controls. On the privacy and breach side, you just you don't. There's no risk analysis that's required, but it's a very quick and 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 efficient way to find out where are we compliant, where are we not compliant, and 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 help us give us what we need to get compliant quickly. You've got the gaps from the risk analysis. Your committee, we're assuming there's more than one person that's going to oversee the risks to the organization uh, as it applies to HIPAA, as it applies to breaches, and uh, you need to work together. So the requirements should go flow from the compliance staff, from the clinical staff, from the administrative staff to the IT staff, and they need to translate those requirements into technical solutions. And sometimes it's a procedure, sometimes it's a tool or an investment in technology, like a web filter. If your clinic does not have a web filter, like if you can go to porn.com right now without any filter, you need to make a request to put a web filter. It's very important. Advanced MD can do a lot to keep your patient data secure in the portal. But it's up to you to make sure that your staff is not going and sending, you know, pictures of the local high school quarterback on uh, Instagram because they have a, a broken wrist and won't be able to play at Friday's game. Very, very important. So you got to work together uh, and differentiate what those requirements are. I know we're coming close to the top of the hour. We touched on this earlier. Uh, I don't think we're going to have time to do a software demo. I don't know, unless you want to do a really quick five-minute overview or four-minute or less. Yeah, Actually, yeah. Bobby's really good at that. Um, encryption for data at rest. It's not only data at rest, but data in transit. A lot of us focus on secure email communication. Uh, you can, you know, we always recommend you communicate through uh, the ad, um, advanced MD um, patient interface. Uh, we also, outside of that um, communication, there are secure email solutions out there, uh, you know, there's uh, secure communications. In terms of your risk as an organization having to report a breach, your number one focus should be on encrypting your laptops, your desktops, your mobile phones, uh, and there's ways to do that. It's not complicated. Is it expensive? That's going to be the question they're going to ask. Small mm. practice, how much is that going to cost me? What's available for free? Uh, good question. So, you know, you're working with your IT staff. They're probably ready to go at any moment in time. If you're using Windows 10, all versions of Windows 10 come with BitLocker now uh, across the board. Meaning, what is BitLocker? Uh, it's you go to your start button, type in the word BitLocker, push enter, and you can literally click a button, turn it on. It may take a while depending how much data you have on your computer. If you have a solid state drive versus a larger spinning drive. Um, it may take longer, but once your data is encrypted, that laptop, whatever you have on there, is now considered secure. It's scrambled, it's encrypted. It, become, it comes free, and it's just a matter of giving it the time to encrypt. And from that point forward, if you have good hardware, if you're buying Microsoft uh, hardware, uh, or Dell or HP for that matter, they all come with uh, the hardware needed to support it and not impact your performance. Uh, so that is probably the most important thing to do uh, for your mobile phones. If you're using Office 365, if you're using Google Docs, it's 
you know, you, you may want to consider looking at Office 365. It Even the lowest level of licensing for $5 per user per month, you don't have to maintain your server, your exchange is included. With that exchange connectivity, you can turn on mandatory encryption, mandatory pins for any Apple, could be Apple, could be um, um, Android devices, connecting in through uh, through that exchange, act, um, exchange Active Sync, you can definitely turn it on there as well and it won't cost you anything. So, you know, if you need more information, we'll have some contact information here at the end. Uh, so it's important to, you know, work with, uh, you know, work with your IT department to get that turned on. So you can go to your IT department and say, can you, you know, we have, how many machines have Windows 10? Can we turn encryption on, on all of them? You know, you, you want to make sure, especially physicians, laptops, uh, are are um, are encrypted. If uh, this will also help with theft, loss, and improper disposal, uh, which if you look at the breach stats that keep coming out, uh, the occurrences, the number of reasons to to report a breach is still in that paradigm. Even though hacking an IT incident affects more individuals and actually a higher number of individuals per month, uh, the number of incidents are fewer. So, Bobby, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you to do a very quick five minute overview of right. how to conduct a quick HIPAA security or privacy risk analysis using the HIPAA One software through Advanced MD. All right, here we go. So, step one, information gathering, question answer. Step two is going to be remediation planning, and step three is where we sign, review, and we've got these ongoing uh, updates. So, very quickly. Log in. If you haven't created an account, you create a new user account. Um, very simply, we ask for the business information as you go through the organization. If you're one location, if you're many locations. Now, if you've used HIPAA One in the past, import assessment. This will save you so much time. All you have to do is select the location. And we, we have uh, organizations that have 30, 50, 100 locations. It's very easy. Grab that one, Newtown Hospital. Click on import assessment. Everything from last year populates into the new year. That's how easy it is. So if you're doing this for the first time, we want to identify what roles, you know, HR, IT, uh, you know, we can outsource a lot of the IT questions. As Steve mentioned, about 30% of those are IT related. So we can delegate those questions to the IT staff. Yeah, so that's a survey question can go up to that individual. They only see their questions, not everything else like like you see for your organization. That's right. Mm -hmm. So this screen represents how far uh, the individual is relative to answering the questions that were assigned to them. So you see HR director 100% complete, HIP security officer hasn't even started. This is more of a dashboard for uh, the orchestrator of this risk assessment within the organization. This is showing an example on the left-hand side. Uh, it's a TurboTax-like approach. So you're given a question, the right uh, little gray area is the regulatory text. The left is our interpretation of the text in white. So do you have a policy and procedure for worker sanctions? The little graph on the left-hand side is somebody that answers, yes, we do. So our software prompts you to prove it. Upload what you have, but it has to have been uploaded in the last few years. On the right-hand side, this is, you know, no, we haven't answered the question. Uh, so we basically say we'll give it to you. Right here is the threat matrix. Every question runs through a threat matrix, likelihood, times impact equals risk. And that happens in the background. That's not something, like if you use the OCR tool, you have to pick what is the likelihood click, what is the impact click. And unless you're an auditor or you've gone through that training, it's very difficult to have a subjective opinion on the matter. HIPAA 1 does that for you and provides all the documentation showing how the calculation works, automating 82% of yep. the actual process. So the interview section, once we're done, everything's in green and we can now move forward to what's called remediation planning. Simply click on this little icon here and pull up uh, the specific item. A couple things I want to point out here. Number one, uh, as Steve said, we do calculate the risk. We auto fill in the threat, the vulnerability, and then you'll notice near the bottom it says action plan. We tell you exactly what you need to do to remediate that item. Very, very clear. So all I need to do now is the assignee section, I need to assign that task to somebody, put their email address in and a target date, and it sets up this thing called the auto harass feature. It's going to continue the email. Hey, you've got a couple items that need to be done. Let's, let's do that immediately. Uh, last piece I want to show you is the executive dashboard. This is going to, on the left-hand side, show you the current risk status. 
the right hand side is going to be risks that have been updated over time. And so the doctor who hasn't you know, really participated, they're seeing patients, they want to see where we are relative to the risks in our organization. This is where they can come in and, and check that out. And then the final report, the software does it in about two seconds. It's perfect every time. It's, it's usually a 50 to 150 page report uh, that we write for you so that you don't have to. So uh, hopefully you're sensing we take the burden of this thing called the security risk assessment and place it on our shoulders and utilize the software to do so. So it's very, very minimal uh, time on your side. Last thing is this action history. This is the ongoing where you log in and this is where now we have put the policy and procedure um, that, that you are going to need and you simply uh, take our policy and procedure, copy paste, put it on your own company letterhead, letterhead get it approved and you're done. Hey, just really quick answer to that question. If you're running a Mac, uh, this software works perfectly using Safari. No worries. This is a cloud technology, uh, so you can use Chrome, Internet Explorer, Safari, uh, Opera, um, Firefox. It works across the board. Thanks so, for your question, Greg. So, so real quick uh, estimate of time. You know, how long is this going to take me? You can see most of the roles are under an hour. The HIP security officer has a few more questions. Mm. It might take you in about an hour and a half. But bottom line is we've taken a very labor-intensive, error-prone, mundane process with spreadsheets and calculations. You don't have to do any of that. Get in, answer your questions, and the software does all the heavy lifting. So it's extremely uh, easy to use. So last thing, um, matter of fact, Mike, this was a picture on the Tennessee Bridge. Uh, when we were out there for the conference. And you'll see a little uh, HIP One shirt I'm wearing. If you have any questions, how much is this going to cost for my organization? Anyone that's on the call, anybody that's on the call, uh, will have all of those things that, that we mentioned made available to you at a discount. We've got some special pricing through Advanced MD. Just simply email info at hipaone.com and we can give you a quick uh, estimate of the organization cost. Uh, yes, and we've got uh, the, uh, just a clarification on that on that question. The encryption for Macs, uh, it actually comes with a built-in program like BitLocker uh, does for Windows uh, called Data Vault, and you can turn it on on a per machine basis. And we've helped several organizations uh, through Active Directory deploy uh, Data Vault uh, across multiple Macs that are connected to an Active Directory domain. So. If you'd like more information, this is the best way to reach us to help get details on how to do that, as well as um, if you uh, think that the bookmarks are a good idea, we can send you some. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we know that this is the day before a long weekend and, and everyone's getting you know ready to go start barbecuing and celebrating Memorial Day. Uh, just keep us in mind today, tomorrow, or when you get back. Uh, and uh, we'd love to hear from you, talk to you, and hopefully have the opportunity to work together. And we. Uh, Appreciate the time with Advanced MD and your time today, and hopefully we're able to share with you something that you can take back to your organization and help improve um, employee morale, patient care, and reduce your chances of a breach. Well, thank you uh, again for the attendees who've attended today, and thank you for our vendor partner, HIPAA One, for producing this. Uh, again, we will, we'll, we're going to actually record this for the participants who came today. We'll follow up with an email with the links to that and the links to the material here. Um, and then as well, you, you'll probably get reached out to by HIPAA One. So uh, we appreciate you attending today. A few other things, you can find uh, HIPAA One in the Advanced MD Marketplace. They've got a great listing there with some video and some other content that will help you just understand a little bit more. And then as well, just look for that follow-up email. We appreciate your, your time today, and everybody enjoy your upcoming weekend.